Here and now for our home and studio audience, here's whose house it is. Paul, let's begin with you. Joan and I both think that this may actually be two people instead of one. Well, that is a very good lightning insight, and we pay tribute to you both for that. Would this house be in the London area? Yes. Would we be talking about two men? Yes. And they're best known in the world of art. Yes. And I will graciously turn it over to Joan <laughs> so that she may guess and be wrong or right. We've had a little word. That's uh, right. So we think that they're peop they are regarded as eccentric uh, in the world of art. Although... For many young artists, they're a great icon figure because they do. Perf they used to do performance art themselves together. And well, you're, you're doing fantastic work. Let me just, because I think you're on the verge. Let me give equal time to Mr. Stewart for just a moment. Yes, I'd like to explain precisely why it is, in fact, uh, not anybody at all that my two esteemed <laughs> colleagues on the left are talking about. This is a very famous young pop combo. Um, <laughs> who Gambaccini makes the mistake of never having heard of, but I will just <coughs> cast light on it in a moment. And because the collection of ceramics was particularly unique, uh, actually had that stunning success of fooling Bakewell completely <laughs> into believing that it was actually the two people that she thinks. The giveaway to me, actually, is the Catholic taste and the collection of catechisms and what have you. And so I know perfectly well who it is. Um, in fact, it is Edward Sturton, the BBC newsreader, <laughs> and his little known brother. <laughs> but I may be wrong. <laughs> but it is, a, it is a fact that, that when Edward was at Amplethorpe, he and his little brother were members of a very, very famous pop combo called the Bookshop Boys that they then gave up and were taken over by the Pet Shop Boys and the rest is history. <laughs> Brilliant. Or not. Did they write or a book not. called Great no, Fusion all... Banjos? Jane, that's, that's what we call in the trade an attempt at humour, while you two <laughs> get it right. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, well that, now, can you come up with any alternative, Joan, or Paul, to well, Alistair's I... suggestion? We, we seriously think it's Gilbert and George. We think it's, it's Gilbert, Gilbert and George! <laughs> Will you come through the keyhole? Welcome, welcome to you both, Gilbert and George. Okay. Uh, very good to have you both with us. Well, there are distinguished denizens over there, Joan and uh, Paul. We're on to you straight away. Immediately, yeah. A tribute to your fame. You, <laughs> you must look so odd that they know immediately. They knew immediately who we were. Yes. I think they knew very quickly, yes. yes, who you were. And how long have you lived in that house? More than, I think, 35 years now altogether, yes. <coughs> we moved to the East End in the mid-60s, and we've been ever since, yeah. Why did you choose the East End? It's the cheapest part of London to live in at that time. <laughs> what a very good reason. <laughs> Wonderful, yes. And Wonderful. so run-down. So run-down and so, uh, it was so romantic. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. Brilliant. Now, how did you both come to embrace this form of art and so on? According to the biogs and so on, in your case, George, it was Dartington Hall had an influence on That was it. the very beginning, yes. Then I moved on to other colleges, and we both slowly came from many different colleges to St. Martin's in London. Because at that time, in the mid-60s, St. Martin's School of Art was the most famous art school in the world. It was extraordinary for four or five years. There were television crews from all over the world every week in the building. It was amazing. And how would you explain to people who don't 
fully understand what sort of performance art is, I mean. Uh, we, we always said we never used the word performance ourselves because we think that performance art is something that's grubby and obscure and strange. And we never felt we did that. We felt we did more of an art for all, a more democratic. In fact, we made ourselves the center of the art and we kept to that. So we are don't, don't do a lot of performance anymore, but we do a lot of very big pictures. We are more interested in that because we are able to express ourselves like the caveman. Like the caveman? Yes. And, and what was your inspiration if his was done starting from Hall? Was, was it uh, in Italy or...? I, was all, I always wanted to be an artist, so I went to, for a while I went to Germany to study and then one day I realized that I had to go to London. And I met George and stepped to St. Martin's School of Art and that was it. And how would you describe the singing sculptures, for instance, George? We think the singing sculpture is something which we realized at college that everyone was making something strange that if you took it outside of the college into the Charing Cross Road, it would lose its value immediately, it would be unnoticeable. So we wanted to make an art that could address anyone with, from any country or any education or social background. And the singing sculpture is something which looks and feels like something you can look at and gaze at, like a waterfall. You can look at it and get many, many different feelings and thoughts from it. Joan, you've been fascinated by this whole subject. Oh yes, I'm enormously interested in what they do. Uh, it changed over the ta over the years. I think the canvases have got bigger, haven't they, George? Have we're they? doing we're doing enormous pictures and enormous exhibitions at this very moment. In fact, we're planning probably the biggest we ever did, which opens in Athens in October this year, and then an even more extensive collection of pictures in Lisbon. Only the monumental pictures. They are all all roughly like twenty, thirty feet long. It's incredible. So. Exactly. Yes, because we want to make an art that, uh, that is visually, uh, visually powerful, that uh, when you have an, an audience in front of you, they are able to feel what it feels being alive. And at the same time, Lloyd was commenting on the fact that the kitchen wasn't used very much, and I, I believe, in fact, you've eaten out for 30 years. Yes. That we've never boiled one egg in the house, it's entirely true. We think, we think it's an enormous advantage, because you don't have to shop, there's lots of hours, in your lifetime that you save. You don't have to cook, you don't have to store food, you don't have to s dispose of rubbish or washing up or anything. It's years and years and years added to our life, in fact. <laughs> and in fact, we always buy in bulk, like toilet paper, for like two years, we never have... Two space. Two or space, or in bulk. Toilet paper. <laughs> two years supply. Oh, yes. Must be hundreds of... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Imagine. But it's very exciting because in the morning, when we get up, we go out of the house. Out. So well, you, go, you go out for breakfast? Before? Immediately. Immediately out. out of the house, we buy a newspaper, go to a small cafe, have breakfast, come back and work, and then we will stop very, very briefly at 11 o'clock because we get up early, so 11 o'clock is our lunch time, and then we will, we will work through until we've either 12 hours around the clock or a little bit more, but never less. And then we go again in the evening to a, a restaurant for dinner. Yeah. Every night? Not the same restaurant? Always at, the moment, at the moment, yes. Quite, quite much the same. We go to a Kurdish restaurant because like all oppressed people, they're especially kind and gentle. So we made enormous friends with the people who run that restaurant. We became so close that the manager invited us to the party for his son's circumcision. Yeah. It was extraordinary. extraordinary. 300, 300 people in a yeah. huge town hall yeah. with drinks on every table, beer, wine, whiskey, even though they don't drink, just to show how especially host-like they are. Extraordinary. Amazing story. The, uh, well, it's absolutely great to have you with us, and of course, you, you won the Turner Prize along the way and all sorts of other things, and we're delighted to have you with us. We Thank really you are. very much. You are a unique duo, and here is the Through the Keyhole Key, which is our modest way of saying thanks a million for letting us see that delightful home, and indeed even, I noticed these matching ties, which are... Near, near matching. Sir. Near matching ties. Great to have you both with us. Thank you very much. Gilbert and George. A huge special thank you to Gilbert and George, and of course to Ian Moore. Not to mention our panelists, Alistair Stewart, Joan Bakewell, and of course, Paul Gambatini. Until the next time, goodbye for now.